come a long, long way together Through the hard times and the good I've got to celebrate you, baby I've got to praise you like I should You're so rare, you're so fine I'm so glad you're mine You're so rare, you're so fine I'm so glad you're mine I was afraid to say I love you Afraid to take and too eager to give You help me Deal with what I'm feeling With why and how I want to live Cause you're so rare You're so fine I'm so glad you're mine So rare So fine You cleared all the questions from my mind We've come a long, long way together through the hard times and the good I've got to take this day to celebrate you baby I've got to stop and praise you like I should Hello, it's really great to see you um, here at the Salon de la Vie, the last of season two My goodness, doesn't time fly? And um, to celebrate with you I've brought you to a totally different secret garden. I'm, I'm on location. Uh, and um, I hope that you uh, have got your drinks and you're having a lovely evening where you are. I'm pretty delighted to be here, quite frankly. Um, and uh, my lovely production assistant, V, who's filming this for me today instead of uh, my usual partner, Adrian, uh, we're gonna enjoy a lovely glass of Chablis at the end of this. So we'll, uh, we'll push hearts to you after this show is out. Um, so today uh, we are going to celebrate and praise like we should Maya Angelou. What a fitting end to season two. Um, I'm going to basically punctuate, well, we're going to punctuate this uh, whole episode with her poems, beginning, middle, end. Uh, so I'm going to start and I think this poem, uh, basically it's another one, an example, and this seems to be a theme throughout this season of how timelessly wise the women are that we have uh, been um, talking about. Uh, every single one seems to be saying stuff to us in every episode and everything we've looked at that could be as much said now as at the time they wrote it. So here's my offering to you for the first poem by Maya Angelou in this salon. Lying, thinking, last night, how to find my soul a home where water is not thirsty and bread loaf is not stone. I came up with this one thing, and I don't believe I'm wrong, that nobody, but nobody, can make it out here alone. There are some millionaires with money they can't use, whose wives run around like banshees and children sing the blues, and they've got expensive doctors to cure their hearts of stone, but nobody. No, nobody can make it out here alone. All alone, all alone. Nobody, but nobody can make it out here all alone. Now, if you listen closely, I'll tell you what I know. Storm clouds are gathering. The wind is going to blow. The race of man is suffering. And I can hear the moan. Because nobody, but nobody, can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone, nobody, but nobody, can make it out here all alone. Which is why it's been so amazing to do these with you. So that's my first dedication to you for this salon. Now I'm going to let Cudsey uh, and I have a little chat. So uh, cut to. Uh, Cudsey's a huge fan um, uh, of Maya Angelou and has lots of interesting things to say about her. One of the things she talks about uh, is um, the sexual abuse and rape of Maya as a child. So this is just a little bit of a trigger warning. Um, uh, and she, that, that whole passage that she talks about, you can find out more about 
um, and kind of clarification on in Maya's first autobiography of her many uh, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings um, or join us after the chat if that's a little bit too close to her view but I think it's only touched on um, because he has many other interesting things to say. See you in a minute. I, I thought I knew what Maya Angelou did because I had like read her poems as a young feminist a young not thin feminist <laughs> and been like oh thank you thank you for this manner from heaven you know mm -hmm. i rise and phenomenal woman and then obviously like got a bit older and also as really she was talking about the experience of being a, a black woman in particular which i didn't I, had, I didn't know that when i just found them in books of feminist poetry and read them and kind of greedily absorbed them because they spoke to my experience of all i hope was in store for me as a woman that you know I felt like in every other story wasn't there for me as a woman because I didn't fit a convention that, that mm. spoke to that story. Um, but of course, then you, then you look at her life and go, oh yeah, she did way more than that. She didn't just exist okay. to be a phenomenal woman to me as a fat child. <laughs> a fat child with hopes to be here to answer that. No, it would be amazing. <laughs> She'd probably say something so wonderful as well in response to that. <laughs> <laughs> so what does she mean to you? What does she, uh, are, are you, were you a fan before? Did you research her for this or how, where, where does she sit in your, so she obviously has that very specific place that I've appropriated her for in my <laughs> life. <laughs> where does she sit in your life? Um, oh yeah, no, I knew of her before this. I mean, she's probably in the same, echelons for me as Nina Simone. Um, I just very, very much resonated with her writing. Um, I remember the bit for me where she just sort of cemented was hearing about her story, very, very matriarchal upbringing between her mother and her grandmother. Oh, yes, and there's a real echo, isn't there? That's yeah, really she's cool. one of those people that I, I think was one of the first moments where I thought oh maybe I can maybe I can because I also contextualized her in the time that she was in and I thought if she could do it then <laughs> maybe <laughs> um so yeah no she's a huge huge inspiration for me um and I just I it, even in watching her in interviews she's a very 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 considered person mm -hmm. and she has like these cookbooks um, that come with these amazing recipes and there's a story for like every recipe. Um, I also realized later on after like really getting into her that she was such a performer. My favorite uh, video of hers is, I don't know if she's doing it as an address to a university, um, but she performs her poem, Still I Rise. Um, and it is so, so beautiful, so beautiful. And she does it with so much joy as well. Um, but her life is very interesting, you know, being a young mother, growing up in a matriarchal mm. home, the way she traveled, wanted to be a singer and a performer and just, there was just so much to her. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, in her writings as well. Um, She's just extraordinary. And I love the poem she did for um, Nelson Mandela's uh, funeral as well. I think it was one of the last ones she ever wrote. Well, that was published, should I say. For all I know, she wrote till the day before she died. But um, <laughs> I wasn't there. Um, but yeah, no. <laughs> um, she really means, and also she was tall, which was very important for me. She's very tall. Ah. Yeah, you're tall. Um, I'm tall. You I'm tall. Tell that about this because we're sitting down. <laughs> because we're sat down. If we were sitting next to each other, it would be really obvious, wouldn't it? It would be. When we're not, when we, when we, hopefully one day we'll do a show where we stand next to each other and everyone can go, oh, Becca's <laughs> or they might just go, well, Becca's short because both of us are. But yes, I, I, there was something about her that. And I mean, I think this is why it's so important tying in things like the single story, what you see around you and who you see making it possible. Because I grew up admiring massively, just going off tangents slightly, you know, people like Bette Davis, Catherine Hepburn, anyone to me who railed against the system. <laughs> this is what I've now realised later on in life. 
I don't think it was because I was so inherently such a goodly two shoes because I had to be. It was very, it was essential to my survival um, to play by the book. And yet, anyone I massively admired <laughs> or felt a kinship with had like gone past the point and allowed themselves to rebel. And um, for me, my Angelou is just so many either contradictions or just um, in, in the sense of like being one thing as well as another rather than, you know, her opinions or whatever. And it was just simple things. Like I thought her voice was deep and yeah. her skin was dark and she was tall and she tried things and then gone maybe not and done something else and moved. She just gave herself so much freedom mm. when, you know, at the age of 17, being a young mother, and in the system she grew up in, she might not have. Um, but the most interesting, not the most interesting thing about her necessarily, but given that she became, you know, a wordsmith, she was about expression. Um, one of the strangest like contradictions of her life, I think, is the fact that she was mute as a child. Really? Um, yeah, she went mute for, I think it was about five, to seven years. Was, was um, or was it a selective? Is it selective? Um, well, she'd been um, sexually abused and um, had then reported the fact that she'd been sexually abused uh, to, I think it was her mother or her grandmother. I think it was her grandmother. Um, and then her grandmother had uh, taken it further and this man, the, the abuser ends up dead and I can't remember if it's because that was the punishment he was given or if he was effectively by their own, by the community um basically like I don't know if it was like public court or if it was through the justice system but he ends up dead and she and she said this um that she felt like she, her voice was so powerful that she'd killed this man um that's how she puts it yeah and so as a child for years she just didn't speak gosh wow that's remarkable yeah yeah and then i think but i think the power of the people around her. So yeah works. no i was gonna say in in when she's telling the story what sort of takes her out of that is the need to express herself. So she talks about absorbing, you know, reading, learning and stuff like that. But it was the need to speak. And I don't know if it was a poem or reading something, but it was something creative that had to be said. And that was when she spoke again. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, really extraordinary. And even the way she talks about her grandmother and her mother, it's like there were three women from an entirely different, world or place because the way they handled each other with such care yeah um in a time when i think as well like facing so much brutality can make you really hard yes. and make you hard with your children and the children that come after that because you're trying to keep them safe um which is there's just yeah i find this story extraordinary <laughs> and just her work lovely. i like i read um i mean this is only a, 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 a notion obviously she's she's knocking about with um you know martin luther king and 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 malcolm x and things and she's i think it's Mar i think she meets malcolm x in ghana which i think you mentioned previously that she'd been it was in ghana and you're absolutely right she she meets him there and uh, it's remembered by her son i think who remembers him doesn't doesn't know who he is he's only little i think he's about eight little boy at the time and he uh, and he says that we get, that malcolm x came around for dinner and he didn't really know who Malcolm X was or anything, but his memory of it is thinking, oh no, he's going to eat more of the fried chicken. There'll be less fried chicken for us. Who is this guy coming here to eat our fried chicken? Which I think is so lovely. Um, but yeah, she, um, uh, when, uh, there's this great story as well about her, her being asked to sort of, um, I think, look over a load of um, Mark, um, Martin Luther King's uh, left work and, and how, uh, uh, when she's quite old herself, it's, long, it's like in the 90s, I think, where she goes to a university to help take care of his legacy and she, they've got a statue they've got they've got a lot of his work there and she's gonna help catalog it and stuff and there and there's a statue and i don't know what's on it but she just like basically says that that quote that you've got on your martin luther king statue makes him sound like an arrogant twit 
and he wasn't. <laughs> and, he was and I think she gets this quote taken off somehow. Which and was it, it was, so the, oh, so the university had chosen to commemorate him with this, yeah. like, quote. And she yeah, was and like, who knows yeah. what, but she didn't feel like it represented him. It made it sound like an arrogant twit, apparently. So she made this, <laughs> I think she managed to get it, get it changed, which is amazing. I love that. I tell you about the uh, the weirdest. This is the last. I think it, uh, this is the, this is my the last the last and weirdest fact possibly of possibly the whole season, which is <laughs> that um, when I was when I was growing up again in my uh, ostensibly ostensibly very very white uh, childhood, very very left wing, very working class. Like my parents were working class socialists. Um, my mum was a green woman and a radical feminist, and my dad was a fantastic pro-feminist ally. So there was lots of politics, but we were very white. We were living in Camberley. Like I didn't meet when did I meet a black person? Gosh, not not Clement University probably even. Like so, so it was a very white childhood. Um, and we, there's a kids song within that by a performer called Bernard Cribbin. I don't know if you've come across Bernard Cribbin. Kind of no, no. A very, a very another, a, another part of sort of growing up in the in the sort of 70s would be that there's this lovely comedy chap. I think that he survived the horrible cull of kind of yew tree. I don't think he's any, any of that's touched to me. He's one of, the, one of the nice male comedians that's left. Oh, uh, so, right. Yeah, you know, no, have all dust on him. Yeah, yeah, not all that. So, so his words was, you can still think, like, oh, Bernard Cribbins, that's nice, you know. And he used to do a song called Right Said Fred. And Right Said Fred is all about painters and decorators and, oh, it's all like, it's the play that goes wrong, but in a song, and it goes, oh, Right Said Fred, better have another one. And it's all a bit <laughs> like this. It comes out of a kind of slightly kind of music hall -y, and it's a comedy song, a good old-fashioned English comedy song. Um, anyway, so that is like, a, a, a would be on lots of children's tapes when I was growing up. Um, and he was he was very loved as a kind of entertainer of doing animals' voices and doing Jackanory and things like that. Anyway, about a year ago, <laughs> I was doing a lot of work on the Mitfords, and I'm a big fan of Jessica Mitford, who uh, was very involved in the civil rights movement actually in America, and um, and is a, and is a is a, a fantastic commie and generally a good a good egg in a very right wing family. Follow the story. But essentially, he sends me a version of it. He's like, I found this. I really weird. Found this about Jessica Mitford. And um, she's doing a, it's her, it's a, quite an older woman doing, it's, it's probably been, it's been done in the kind of 80s or eight, about the eight, in the 80s, I think. And it's it's on YouTube and it's a song, it's her doing the song, Right Said Fred, Better, with Bernard Cribbins and Maya Angelou. What? I know. It's like, what? So you get this like, you get Jessica Mitford, who's great fun, but not a performer at all. With uh, with with her in incredibly cut glass voice. Yeah, I can yeah. imagine. Yeah, even through years of living in America. She's the one who the sisters were like all married to Nazis. Is that am I paraphrasing? No, you're exactly right. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that, all married to Nazis, apart from her, she's like, screw the lot of you. I'm going to America because this is awful. So yeah, she absolutely is that. Bad. And she goes tripping off across the Atlantic and has a whole life with the you know Mick too. She marries she, she marries. Uh, Jewish guy, she has a mixed race uh, son-in-law and baby, and so she's totally like couldn't be more opposite to her family. And anyway, all of that brings her at some point to to singing "Right Said Fred" with Bernard Cribbins giving it all of that as a, as another older guy, and Maya Angelou's really deep old woman voice as well. Oh, all wow. the way. It is the most surreal recording. <laughs> is it on YouTube? Like, where is Literally, it? You put in Bernard Cribbins and Angela and, and Maya Angelou, and it will come up, and oh you will God, sit there like this <laughs> for like four minutes. <laughs> you may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken? Bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? 
don't you take it awful hard. Because I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide, leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. The amazing Kudzi there reading the amazing Still I Rise. Um, I just want to, you know, she's been brilliant, isn't she? It's been great to have her in there and uh, in this mix this season and um, sort of we're working on hopefully trying to get a season three, so spoiler alert about that. Um, but if we do, I've, I've, I've sort of saved a few bits of Kudzi or we'll be working together again on a few bits in that, so I'm hoping that you'll see her again. So um, let's not say goodbye to Kudzi, but let's just say thank you to her. Um, and also let us say thank you to Rosie, who uh, is letting me be in her secret garden. Which I am absolutely loving. This is dedicated to her, this next song. And I'm, I'm kind of going back to the beginning with this song because it's Billie Holiday where we started this season. Um, but it really speaks to all of the women that we've been looking at in this season, their kind of independence and their, their fierceness of spirit and getting down to brass tacks what they knew they needed to do um, to make their, make, making their own way and their stand. And, um, and I, whenever I'm reading Maya Angelou's fabulous uh, autobiographies, um, this song seems to be sort of playing through them. I don't know. Anyway, this is what I'm, this is what I'm going to play you. Them that's God shall get, them that's not shall lose. So the Bible said, and it still is news. Mama may have, Papa may have, but God bless the child that's got her it's got her own. Yes, the strong get more while the weak ones fade. Empty pockets don't ever make the grade. Cause mama may have, papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own. God his own. Nani, you've got lots of friends crowding round the door. When you're gone and spending ends, they don't come no Rich relations give crusts of bread and such. You can help yourself, but don't take too much. Cause your mama may have, and your papa may have. But God bless the child that's got their own. That's got their own. So I'm going to finish off now with the last poem that I promised you. The, uh, we're doing a, a, a triathlon of Maya. 
Um, and this one is definitely dedicated to all of you who've been watching this. This is the poem, this is the piece of work that if you take nothing else with you from these salons that we've done together, coming out of a really difficult time, going into certainly at least an uncertain time, but going it not alone and with friends and each other, um, and certainly with salons and celebration, I want you, I really want you to have this and to think of this and this be about you. So here we go. It is of course Phenomenal Woman. Pretty women wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute, nor built to suit a fashion model's size. But when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say, it's the reach of my arms. It's the span of my hips, the stride of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally phenomenal woman. That's me. I walk into a room just as cool as you please and to a man the fellows stand or fall on their knees and they swarm around me, a hive of honeybees. I say it's the fire of my eyes, it's the flash of my teeth, it's the swing in my waist, it's the joy in my feet. I'm a woman, phenomenally phenomenal woman. That's me. Men themselves have wondered what they see in me. They try so much but they can't touch my inner mystery. They say they still can't see when I try to show them. I say it's the arch of my back, the sun of my smile, the ride of my breasts, the grace of my style. I'm a woman phenomenally phenomenal woman that's me now you understand just why my head's not bowed i don't shout or jump around or have to talk real loud when you see me passing it ought to make you proud i say it's the click of my heels the bend of my hair the palm of my hand the need for my care because i'm a woman Phenomenally, phenomenal woman. That's me, that's you, that's us. Thank you so much. Thank you to my whole team. Thank you for sticking with this. Come back for the specials. We're gonna be doing some specials. And uh, thanks to my little ukulele for getting me through all this. You're all a load of buttes. Um, just so you know, uh, me and uh, Cuds couldn't stop talking about <laughs> about that YouTube clip that my dad sent me about Maya Angelou and Bernard Cribbin and, uh, and Jessica Mitford. Um, this is a little secret squirrel thing. This is a, a Mitford garden that I'm in. That's why I'm here, because we're doing a little Mitford project. Um, so, uh, so I just thought I'd let it play out today with, um, with uh, the rest of me and Cuds chatting away. Uh, on in total disbelief about that so that's good you'll have a little look at that over the credits if you want to thank you so much I love you all see you soon stay safe hang tough be phenomenal because you are what? I really want to see this now <laughs> you, you can it is there I encourage us all to do that <laughs> And then leave a comment. <laughs> oh, yeah. Leave all the comments. Yeah. Just leave. Yeah. I think most of the comment will be, how? Was yeah, because I'm trying, I'm like, the connection is what I'm trying to, like, how did they meet? <laughs> and it's just when they met. How did it, they, you can imagine them like chewing the fat about, you know, their parallel socialist campaigning or their life as. I don't know. I don't know where, but I can see what Jessica and Maya might talk about. Maybe there's a yes. lot of Cribbins. That That's the bit that I'm like, yeah. maybe, where? Maybe he was a socialist as well. We don't know. Maybe they get talking about Labour or the NHS. And then some, at some point, over, I'm guessing, a lot of drinks, does Bernard Cribbins <laughs> or someone ask him, do you know I want to know whose idea it was, exactly. That's the bit yeah. that's also like, first they together. And then then he was like, like I know. <laughs> I what we should cover. I what tell you what we should do. Yeah. Somebody should tape it. Yeah. I'm not just sobered up. 
and still decided it was a good idea. And <laughs> yeah, no, I like, know. Yeah, I get it. That into the world. <laughs> so yeah, I love it. Mind boggled. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs>